Hi, everyone. Let's get started. <coughs> so uh, today we'll be covering the things that we didn't get to last time with regard to uh, meta-learning and black box adaptation approaches to meta-learning. And then we'll cover topics in optimization-based approaches. Uh, so before we get started, a couple of reminders. So first, homework one is due on Wednesday next week, and that homework assignment is now out. Um, and yeah, encourage you to, to get started on that uh, early. And then also the first paper presentations and discussions of papers will be happening on Wednesday this week. Uh, and so please uh, show up so we can discuss those papers and also um, kind of be a part of the discussion for the students that are presenting uh, that day as well. Okay, um, so as I was mentioning today, we'll first uh, start by uh, actually by recapping the probabilistic formulation of meta-learning that I mentioned at the end of lecture last time. Uh, and then cover kind of a general recipe for different meta-learning algorithms uh, and cover black box adaptation approaches. These uh, kind of, these two things are the topic of homework one where you'll be implementing uh, a black box approach to meta-learning. And then we'll be talking about optimization-based meta-learning. Uh, and this will actually be part of homework two. Uh, and uh, the rest of homework two will be covered uh, in the next lecture on Monday next week. Okay. So first, let's recap from last time. So we were talking about uh, kind of a, a more intuitive or, or probabilistic view to these meta-learning algorithms. Uh, and in particular, we could view meta-learning as a process of learning a set of meta-parameters theta uh, that summarizes your meta-training data such that you can solve new tasks quickly. Uh, and what this meta-training data looked like was uh, you had a range of tasks, one through n. And for each task, you had a training data set and a test set. Uh, and the training data set had k data points, and the test set had k data points. Uh, and so, in particular, what meta-learning was trying to do was to optimize for a set of meta, um, for a set of meta parameters uh, that uh, maximized the likelihood of those parameters. And so, in particular, you could view kind of the meta-training process as optimizing for these meta parameters, and the adaptation process as adapting those parameters uh, to compute a set of parameters phi that uh, can solve a new task given a training data set for that task and the meta parameters that you learned. Um, and so you could essentially view uh, kind of this adaptation process as this function f that's taking in a training data set uh, and producing a new set of parameters phi star. Uh, and kind of under this uh, view of, um, of the adaptation process, you can kind of view uh, meta-learning as optimizing for the meta-trained parameters such that the task-specific parameters uh, do well on held-out data, your test set, where the task-specific parameters are computed according to your training data set for that task. Okay, so this is like essentially the probabilistic view on meta-learning where you can view uh, kind of the meta-training process as trying to optimize for these uh, these kind of prior parameters such that adaptation leads to good performance. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about how we actually kind of design algorithms that perform this optimization, and basically at a more mechanistic level, and, and cover kind of how you'd actually go about trying to implement some of these things. So uh, in particular, we, like, can we think about a general recipe for meta-learning algorithms? Uh, and before I actually cover a general recipe for the algorithms themselves, uh, we need to have a sense for how we're actually going to be, going to be evaluating these meta-learning algorithms. Um, so I want to first talk about how to evaluate um, a meta-learning algorithm. And uh, kind of the first thing worth mentioning here, uh, the first thing uh, that we should mention is the, the Omniglot data set. So this is a data set uh, that was proposed by Brendan Lake et al. in 2015. Uh, and it actually really uh, kind of exemplifies some of the, the weak points with neural networks with regard to learning from small amounts of data. So uh, this data set has 600, uh, 1,600 characters from 50 different alphabets. Uh, here are some examples of the, um, of the data set. So there's different alphabets uh, like Hebrew, Bengali, et cetera. Uh, and each character uh, has only 20 instances. Uh, so unlike something uh, like MNIST that has a few number of characters and a huge number of data points per character, uh, in, in many ways, this is sort of like the transpose. It has many classes and a few examples per class. Uh, and one of the things that I think is, is quite appealing like, uh, to a data set like this is that the statistics of this data set are in many ways more reflective of the types of things that we see in the real world. 
Uh, for example, if you uh, kind of are trying to learn how to recognize uh, forks, for example, you're not going to see thousands and thousands of different types of forks. Uh, you may see uh, uh, a wide range of objects, but you're only going to see per object a small number of instances of that object throughout your lifetime. Um, okay, so this data set is kind of, has kind of the breadth of classes and, and a small number of examples per class. Uh, and they propose a few different ways that you could try to use this data set. So they propose both few shot discriminative learning as well as few shot generative learning problems. Uh, and in particular, what these look like is uh, the few shot discriminative learning is given a few examples of new characters, can you learn to classify between those characters? Uh, and the generative problem is likewise, given a few examples of some characters, can you actually generate new instances of those characters? Uh, and they essentially showed that things like deep neural networks uh, struggle at, at this sort of problem if you're going to be, going to be training them from scratch, because if you're only training them on a few examples, uh, we know that deep neural networks do best when you have a large number of examples. Um, and initial approaches towards this kind of problem, um, actually predating the Omniglot data set itself, uh, instead used things like Bayesian models and non-parametrics in order to solve this problem. Um, great, so this is kind of uh, one kind of canonical example for a meta-learning data set, and there are a wide range of others that have also been used for meta-learning more recently. Uh, and these include things like the mini ImageNet data set, uh, the CIFAR data set, um, CUB, Celebe, uh, and a number of others. Uh, and all of these data sets, kind of the goal is to, given a small number of examples, be able to learn something from that small data set. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of on the data set side. This is, these are the kinds of data sets that you can use to evaluate a few shot learning algorithm. Uh, now, how do we actually go about evaluating an algorithm on these data sets? Uh, and so this is actually gonna look a lot like the test that I gave you on the first day, where your goal is to classify new examples from a small data set. And so in particular, let's say that we have a five-way one-shot image classification problem. Uh, and in particular, we could have um, one example of five different classes shown here. Uh, way means the number of classes, shot means the number of examples per class. Uh, and then your goal is given these uh, five examples, classify new examples as being among one of the five classes on the left. Okay, so this is uh, the few shot learning problem and in meta learning, our goal is to be able to leverage data from other image classes in order to solve this problem. Just like be able to leverage the meta training data set that I was mentioning before in order to learn a few shot classifier uh, that can kind of learn from these data points on the left. So the way that we can do that is we can structure uh, the data into training sets and test sets just like I was mentioning before where this is gonna mimic what you're going to be seeing at test time, matching meta training time and meta testing time. So you can take five other image classes, classes and break it into a training set and a test set and do this for a wide range of other image classes that you've seen in the past. Uh, these will be your training classes uh, and you'll perform meta training across these, training, meta training the classifier such that after it sees the images on the left, it can successfully classify images on the right. Uh, and then critically, after you do this, uh, you'll test it on held out image classes as shown on the top, uh, and it will essentially be able to perform this few shot learning problem. Uh, and this isn't specific to image classification. You can replace image classification with a regression problem, language generation problems, skill learning problems. Uh, kind of as I alluded to in previous lectures, uh, each of these tasks shown as rows is essentially a machine learning problem. Okay, so any questions on this setup? Okay, yeah. Um, what is the nuance here between multitask and data learning? Yeah, so the nuance here is that in, um, in multitask learning, your goal would be to, tra to solve all of the training tasks shown in, this, in, this in the gray box. Uh, whereas in meta learning, your goal is to use these training tasks in order to solve new tasks with small amounts of data. So kind of being able to actually evaluate on new tasks and quickly learn new tasks is the critical difference between the, the two problems. Okay, um, so kind of more broadly and more generally, we can kind of view the meta-learning problem from a more mechanistic standpoint. Um, and so in particular, if we say supervised learning is trying to learn a mapping from X to Y, uh, given input-output pairs, 
we can view meta-supervised learning as trying to learn from a data set uh, to make uh, where this data set contains k input output pairs for a k-shot learning problem to make predictions about new test data points, x test. So our goal is to uh, kind of produce a function that takes as input a training data set and a test input and produces the label corresponding to the test input. So uh, this more mechanistic view of meta-learning is essentially that we want to learn this function f. Uh, the function f that takes in the training data set and the test input and produces the label. Uh, now, the way that we learn this, uh, this function is through a meta training data set, which contains a, a set of tasks or a set of data sets, uh, where each data set consists of x, y pairs, where you'll use uh, at least k to be used for the training data set, and at least one additional data point to be used to measure generalization, to actually train it such that uh, it does well on new data points. Now, uh, why is this view, use, view useful? So we, we kind of saw the probabilistic viewpoint before. Uh, one of the nice things about this particular problem statement is that it reduces the problem of meta-learning to that of designing and optimizing this function f. Uh, once you kind of design this function f and, and kind of decide how you want to optimize it, uh, then you've created a meta-learning algorithm. Okay, um, how does this connect to the probabilistic viewpoint? Uh, well, you can... Uh, view supervised learning as doing inference over parameters given a data set. Uh, similarly, you can view uh, the adaptation process uh, of meta-learning as doing inference over your task-specific parameters phi i, given a training data set and, uh, and a set of meta-parameters, and the meta-learning optimization as doing um, maximum likelihood uh, inference over the meta-parameters uh, over all of your training tasks. Okay, um, any questions on kind of the problem setup before we get into algorithms? Yeah. Um, is it important to choose the proper value for k or is it? Yeah, that's a good question. So typically algorithms assume that you know, um, you know something about the k that you'll be evaluated on at test time. So if you're going to be evaluated on 10-shot learning or 100-shot learning, then you'll uh, train for those values. Uh, and you could train for, um, depending on the algorithm, you could train for exactly the value that you think you're going to have at test time or a range of values such that um, it can adapt to a range of data set sizes. Yeah. So your question is, what if you don't know the test task that you're going to be evaluated on? Yeah, so generally the assumption here uh, is that the, the test task that you're being evaluated on is from the, distribution, the same distribution as the training tasks. Uh, and well, some, some algorithms do better than others when you break that, viol break that assumption, uh, and I'll talk about that a bit more in the second half of this lecture. Uh, there's also kind of this online setting where you're incrementally adding tasks, and uh, that's a setting that has been explored a little bit, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about probably um, as when we talk about lifelong learning in the course. Uh, and then we'll also talk a little bit about, set, like later in the course, about settings where you just uh, know nothing, you just have like an unlabeled data set and, and how you might be able to try to construct tasks automatically. Was there another question? Yeah. Is meta-learning required to use the same network structure? So you're asking, is it required to use the same network structure as supervised learning or? I guess we'll, we'll get into the, this, the kind of what different architectures you can use for different algorithms uh, later in the lecture. And then if you still have the, a question, you can ask it maybe towards the end. Okay, great. So uh, the general recipe for what an algorithm looks like uh, is basically what I alluded to before, is choose some form of this function that is uh, that could be probabilistic or it could be a deterministic function, as I mentioned before, where you're going to be outputting a set of task-specific parameters 
given a training data set and your meta parameters. Uh, and then once you choose the form of this, then you need to just figure out how you want to choose to optimize your parameters data with respect to your um, meta training data set. And this, this choice is usually somewhat relatively straightforward using standard uh, neural network optimizers. Okay, so this is kind of the general form. Uh, and most meta learning algorithms vary based off of the first point. Uh, basically, how do you actually design this function that's gonna infer task specific parameters? Uh, and so the first class of approaches that we'll look at are going to be considering, can we treat this, um, this, this distribution as an inference problem? Uh, and in particular, neural networks are, are pretty good at doing things like inference. Uh, and so can we just treat this function as a neural network? Um, and this is where uh, what I'm going to refer to as black box approaches come in. So uh, what these black box adaptation approaches is they essentially just train a neural network to represent this function right here. That's a, a neural network that's going to be outputting parameters given a training data set and a set of metaparameters. And so first for now we're going to be using a deterministic or point estimate of this distribution. Um, and we'll kind of get back to Bayesian approaches in a couple of lectures. Uh, and the way this looks like is you can have uh, some neural network that uh, has parameters theta. It takes as input the training data. It could take it in as input in a sequential fashion, or it could take it in uh, kind of all as one batch. And it outputs a set of task-specific parameters phi i. Uh, and then you have a separate neural network that's parameterized by phi i that makes predictions about test data points. Uh, and this is essentially your, uh, the test data. You can basically train this, um, train everything using your test data set di test. Uh, and so this is like really simple. Uh, and some of the nice things about this is we can just train it with standard supervised learning. Um, so we can say that the, um, we want to be able to uh, maximize the probability of the labels under the distribution that G, G is producing uh, for all of the test data points uh, and for all of the tasks in your meta training data set. Um, so essentially what you're doing is this, you're training this neural network such that it outputs parameters that uh, represent an accurate classifier. Um, so if you denote this right-hand part as the loss for a set of parameters phi, given a test data point, uh, then you could essentially view this optimization as, um, as the, uh, the loss function between the parameters that are outputted, uh, a loss function that takes in the parameters that are outputted by F theta, evaluated on your test data set, averaged all over all of your tasks. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Yeah. Uh, so when you evaluate your model, which phi i do you use? Right, so when you evaluate your model, you're given a new task. Uh, and so you're given a training data set for a new task. And so what you do is you're, um, you, for your test task, you basically pass in that training data set into your network f theta uh, and, and produce your parameters for that task. So in this case, the, um, during the meta training process, the parameters theta are learned and the parameters phi i are, are somewhat dynamically computed per task. Um, so in this sense, phi i is almost treated more as um, activations or a, ten or a tensor rather than actual parameters, um, which is somewhat of an interesting concept. Um, the, yeah, basically you can backpropagate the loss with respect to phi into the metaparameters data. Yeah. Uh, so this is homework related to Mary's question, uh, to the Mary's homework assignment. Uh, but in the homework assignment, it says that the last output also has an input label. So like how we have x1, y1, and x2, y2. I think that the homework also said that we should have x, t, s, y, t, s, and set y, t, s to zero. Is that just like to tensor shape? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the question was relating to the, um, basically, should you be, like, uh, in the homework, you're, we are also passing in y test 
uh, as input to uh, the right hand side and then and zeroing it out. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you have this kind of this type of architecture that's an LSTM um, and you want to basically be sharing weights across time for each of these units, then you want the shape of the tensors uh, shape of the, the inputs at each, uh, at each data point to be the same. Uh, and so if you want that, then you want to be able to basically pass in, um, pass in the same shape, but of course you don't want to give it the, the ground truth label uh, because the label is what it's supposed to be predicting. Oh, so we should like, zero out the embedded value or provide like, lies to that? Like, so the question was to zero out the label value or the embedding value yeah, of why. Of why. Um, I think that basically as long as you're not passing in Y test as input in any way, uh, you're, you're in good shape. Are you asking about, can you maybe repeat your question? So uh, in the first statement there, P of pi is given, and you're saying that that is a zero network. Mm -hmm. Does theta go as input? Oh, um, right. So you're asking basically does this top function here is theta an input or is it parameters? Uh, in this case, it is, um, it is the kind of the parameters of that model. Uh, and so maybe a more standard notation would be to either put this theta um, as subscript to the p or uh, put a semicolon here to indicate that it's parameters rather than an input. So we are optimizing over theta and not pi? Uh, during meta training, we are optimizing over theta. But the inner loop is optimized over phi. Yeah, in the inner loop, you're producing phi. Right, yeah, so phi, yeah, exactly. Phi is computed at test time given the training data set as input. Yeah. Uh, and let's go, let's go through a couple more of the details here uh, before we answer any more questions about this. So the um, kind of, this is, uh, I just covered what the objective is. Now let's, let's actually look at this as an algorithm. So uh, what we do is we, if we want to actually optimize this, uh, we first sample a task I, one of our meta training tasks, or a mini batch of tasks. Uh, then we sample disjoint data sets from that task data set, uh, which we'll refer to as dtrain and dtest. So if this is all of the data that we have for task I, then what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to partition this into a training data set and a test set for that task. Uh, and so in particular, what we can do is we can basically pick, uh, randomly select half of them to be used for the training data set and half of them to be used for the test set at this iteration of the algorithm. Then we'll take the training data set uh, the, what's in the green box and use that to compute the task specific parameters phi i. And then we'll update our meta parameters using the gradient of the objective with respect to the meta parameters using the computed task specific parameters. <coughs> uh, and then we'll repeat this uh, iteratively <coughs> using your favorite uh, gradient descent op uh, optimizer, things like atom, SGD, uh, momentum, et cetera. So we're not computing gradients using the training set? Um, so, so the question was, like, we're not compu computing gradients using the training data set. So what we're using is we're um, computing gradients using the meta training data set uh, of tasks. And so the task specific parameters are computed using dtrain. And the, uh, then we evaluate those parameters using the test data set for that meta training task. So we've kind of lifted the, the training data sets from kind of training data sets and test data sets to meta training sets and meta test tasks. So, yeah. So this is of the meta parameters. Uh, which are, are there parameters that are not meta parameters? It seems like they all are meta parameters. 
you're asking if theta, theta is all metaparameters? Yeah, so all of theta is, uh, are the metaparameters, and then phi are considered the task-specific parameters, or the, theta, phi is essentially not considered part of the, the metaparameters. Why would you do like a one-cost or something like that? Like we talked earlier, or? Um, we'll get into what phi might be in a second. It could be the, base, basically, it could be the, the parameters of an entire neural network. Uh, it could also be something that's more compact, and I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah? Yeah, just to clarify the training and, and test. Um, so this DI up here on number two, uh, that's the meta training. Yes, right? yeah, and that's so the meta. a completely different meta test data set that we haven't touched. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we haven't touched any of the meta test tasks uh, that are kind of held out from the uh, task distribution. Yeah? Um, so in this case, uh, I'll assume that order of the inputs matter. So like this, like in this case, this is one task, and if we have like x2, y2 be the first input, that would be like another task. Right, so in this case, for this particular network architecture, the order of the training data sets, the order of the, the data points matters. Uh, and this actually isn't necessarily a good property because in many cases, the, the you have data sets, not data lists, uh, for which the order doesn't matter. Um, and so we'll see some architectures that later see some architectures where you, they are permutation invariant. Yeah. So in this case, we, we compute phi in step three, and then we uh, update the metaparameters theta. So we do not update phi uh, itself. It's, it's basically dynamically computed at every iteration of the meta training process. Uh, and then at test time, we're also going to be computing phi given our metaparameters theta. Yeah. And then just to, to uh, just find a better bit that we compute phi and then we do an optimization step of phi and then run that like updated phi back to the network. Yeah, so it's similar to that. So the we essentially compute you can you can view the 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 computation of the gradient with respect to theta as basically backpropagating the loss from, from y into phi back, in, back all the way into theta. We don't ever use that gradient to, to update phi. We only use it to update theta, but it has to go through phi in order to compute that gradient. Yeah. Um, I, I don't understand why you keep talking about an LSD in order to join um, I'll talk a bit about architectures in a minute, but one of the nice, one of the things about LSTMs and, and RNNs is that they can uh, process variable amounts of data relatively easily. Uh, so you don't have to assume any data, any particular data set size, although you should probably train it for the largest possible data set size. Um, but there are other neural network architectures that I'll talk about that you can use for this as well. Okay, um, so now one of the challenges with this approach is that if, uh, if phi is literally representing all the parameters of another neural network, uh, it may not be that scalable to actually output um, all of those neural network parameters because neural networks can be very large. So um, there are a couple of approaches for dealing with this, but the main kind of way you can think about doing this is you don't need to necessarily output all of the parameters of a neural network. You could instead just output the sufficient statistics of that task such that you could effectively make predictions for that task. Um, and so what this looks like is instead of having a neural network that outputs all of the parameters phi, it'll output uh, some set of sufficient statistics h. Uh, and then this, uh, like some, some lower dimensional vector h. And then your, uh, your neural network on the right will use those uh, sufficient statistics as well as other parameters in theta in order to make predictions. Uh, and so what this lower dimensional vector h might represent is things like contextual task information. Uh, and then your new parameters phi i are going to correspond to h i as well as uh, part of theta that will parameterize g. Uh, and so essentially the way that you can view this as is you can uh, basically view this if you uh, basically view this as a single LSTM that's taking in uh, data points. Uh, so 
One of the reasons why I named this H is H is often used for the hidden state of an LSTM. If you basically share all the parameters um, between both F on the left and G, as for example an LSTM, uh, then the task specific parameters phi are represented by the hidden state of that LSTM, as well as the parameters of uh, the function on the right that are shared with the LSTM parameters. Um, so one interesting connection here is that if you recall uh, multitask learning where we were uh, concatenating task information Z into the network, uh, you could view H uh, essentially as a summarization of the task that is used to make predictions for that task. So H and Z uh, are very similar. Uh, in this case, unlike Z in the multitask learning setting, we're actually learning the task representation H in this case. And we're learning how to produce that task representation H given a small data set of that task. Okay, and so the, the fully general form of black box neural networks is a function that takes as input a training data set and a test input and produces a test output. Um, where phi is, is somewhere uh, in the middle of this network and may not actually be something that is uh, actually representing parameters per se. Yeah. Right, so the question is, can you explain what theta g means here? Um, so here basically theta g uh, represents all of the other parameters that this, uh, that this network g is representing other than h. Uh, so uh, this neural network right here that's making, prediction about test, making predictions about test inputs will take as input h and will also have other parameters theta g that it will use to make predictions. Theta g will be a part of the, the full parameter vector theta. Uh, and it may also share parameters with this part of the network right here. Yeah. So implicitly, we're now sharing more than what you were doing previously, right? Because previously, you were saying you would output all the parameters of a new neural, of say a neural network, but now you're sharing say theta g with, potentially sharing theta g with the or the other meta training architecture. Yeah, so in this case, you might be sharing more, uh, more parameters between test time and, and training time. Okay, um, so this is the kind of overview of black box approaches, and let's now talk about what sort of architectures we could use for this function f. Um, so one of the first, um, well, I guess it's hard to say what, what comes, comes first in research in general, but um, one of the earlier approaches to these sorts of black box approaches um, is using LSTMs or neural Turing machines. Uh, that take as input the test inputs and uh, basically the data set uh, and be able to make and use that to make predictions about new data points. Um, LSTMs are, are probably something that's familiar to you. Uh, neural Turing machines are something that have more of an external memory mechanism for which it can essentially store uh, information about the training data points and then access that information when making predictions about new data points. Uh, and it, it d does this in a differentiable way. Uh, you can also use something that, uh, so kind of, as was noted before, this is not permutation invariant because you're taking in the data point sequentially. Uh, and you can also use an architecture that is permutation invariant by having a feed forward function that takes as input each of your training data points uh, x and y, uh, x1, y1, x2, y2, et cetera, uh, and then aggregates that information using something like an average operation uh, to compute uh, something that looks like, uh, in this case, what's denoted as a or R, uh, and then that is passed into another feed forward network to make predictions about new data points. Um, beyond these, uh, these two types of architectures, there's a wide range of others that have been proposed that have used other memory mechanisms um, as well in combination with uh, ideas from kind of having slower weights and faster weights. Um, often when people use the terms slow weights and fast weights, they refer to the task specific parameters as fast weights and, and the meta parameters as slow weights uh, because one of them is updated much more quickly than the other one. Uh, this is a concept that uh, was developed by um, folks in neuroscience actually uh, that have looked at kind of the, the um, how weights have been changing and how, uh, how uh, synapses change in the brain. Uh, and then 
Uh, there's also an architecture that has used a combination of attention mechanisms and convolutions. Uh, so in this case, convolutions are actually going to be not permutation invariant, although uh, attention-based architectures can be permutation invariant. Um, and kind of as a representative approach of kind of the black box approaches in general, um, these, this type of method that uses, uh, that uses uh, convolutions and attentions is able to do quite well on things like Omniglot, uh, getting around 97 to 99% accuracy on uh, things ranging from five-way one-shot to 20-way five-shot Omniglot. And also does well on the mini image net data set that is performing uh, like five way classification for actually real images from the image net data set. Yeah? Um, is there something that is uh, like an equivalent sufficient statistic for the neuroscience based external memory mechanisms? It seems like if you're using any sort of neuroscience based learning paradigm, you won't actually have any sort of like low dimensionality uh, reduction of like your parameters from passing to the meta training. Um, so the question is the. Like, is there any um, mechanisms relating to neuros? Yeah, like, is there a lower, is there like a lower dimensional HI for like the other external memory mechanisms? What do you mean by HI? Um, back to the sufficient statistics from the last slide. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, I guess I'm not, uh, I'm not too familiar with the, the neuroscience literature uh, to be able to comment on that in a, uh, in a competent way. The, I guess one thing I will say that has been somewhat inspired by the neuroscience literature is that people have looked at um, things that look like LSTMs but do more of a Hebbian rule, update rule on that, uh, on H, on HI, um, in order to uh, kind of update the sufficient statistics with respect to a given task given your training data sets. Um, other works from, um, I guess, one thing that is perhaps worth noting that we will actually cover in one of the reading sessions um, is that the, I guess, there are a number of uh, neuroscience uh, researchers at DeepMind that have looked at these types of meta-learning methods, uh, and they have focused on, on actually these types of meta-learning methods more so than optimization-based or non-parametric approaches uh, using things like, like LSTMs. Yeah. Yeah, so in general, I'm, I'm under the opinion that OmniGlock performance has saturated uh, for the most part. So um, one of the algorithms that we'll be talking about later in this lecture uh, gets like 99.9% uh, accuracy on five-way five-shot OmniGlot. Uh, things that aren't solved are generation of OmniGlot digits. That's certainly something that's a lot harder and was actually proposed in the original paper. Uh, also, um, this is a bit of a nuanced point, but the, the meta-train, meta-test split that they proposed in the original Omniglot paper is actually not the one that's used in all the machine learning papers because it is a bit, uh, it proposes a, a train test split that doesn't have quite enough training data points for these models to not overfit a lot. Um, and so if, if you're look interested in looking at very efficient learning, uh, then you, I think that performance isn't quite as saturated when you move towards the original meta-train, meta-test split. Um, but then it's just a matter of putting inductive biases into your network. Okay, um, so in homework one, uh, you'll be implementing the, kind of the data processing pipeline for these meta training algorithms that involves actually taking the Omniglot data set, for example, and actually loading images and, and plugging them into a neural network. This is actually a pretty fundamental part of these algorithms. Uh, you'll also be implementing a very simple black box meta learner uh, and also training a few shot Omniglot classifier. Uh, and you can use kind of, uh, you can somewhat compare it to uh, some of the numbers in these papers. Okay, um, so to wrap up black box adaptation, uh, the pros and cons of this approach is that first is very expressive. So given that neural networks are universal function approximators, these methods can represent any function of your training data set. Uh, and they're also very easy to combine with a variety of learning problems. For example, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, and later in this course, we'll talk about how we can combine these methods with reinforcement learning. Um, it's, it's the kind of the spoiler is that it's, it's very straightforward, uh, as you might imagine with these types of models. The downsides of this approach is that, uh, in general, these neural networks are, are fairly complex because they need to be taking in data sets and making predictions about new data points. 
They essentially need to figure out how to learn from data. Uh, and they need to do, those, do this in a completely, like basically completely from scratch. Like at initialization, these, these LSTMs were not built as, as optimization procedures. And they need to learn those optimization procedures uh, from scratch, from the Mediterranean data. Uh, and as a result, they're often fairly data inefficient. Um, and by this, I mean not data inefficient at meta test time, but they often require a large number of um, kind of a large amount of meta training data, a large number of tasks in order to perform well. Okay. Any questions on black box approaches before we move on? Yeah. As, uh, as far as many future learning algorithms, I know the test data also takes X test as the input. And it seems that's not the case in this diagram. So do they come from a different perspective or what's it called, connected? So, um, I guess the, so the question was, there are other algorithms that take X test as input. Um, and you could certainly, like, you could certainly integrate X test as much as possible in, uh, on, into the kind of left-hand side of this diagram. Um, it's still kind of part of the input. And if you look at kind of the, the general form of, um, of these algorithms, it, it, it's something that takes in the training data set and the test input. And you can really design whatever architecture you want to integrate those pieces of information, whether or not they're integrated kind of somewhat separately or treated somewhat separately or integrated uh, in the same part of the network, that, that's up to you. Okay, great. So let's talk about um, optimization-based approaches. So the, I guess the motivation here is that uh, as we talked about a bit before, if we want to infer all of the parameters of a neural network, uh, having a neural network output them isn't a very scalable way to do that. Uh, and instead, what we could do is instead of uh, treating this function as an inference problem, we can instead treat it as an optimization procedure. Uh, and this is similar to what we do in supervised learning. We treat uh, parameter, like inference over parameters as an optimization problem, not as necessarily uh, an, an inference problem. Uh, and this is where optimization-based meta-learning approaches come in. So the key idea behind these methods is that we're gonna acquire our task-specific parameters phi i through optimization, and then we'll differentiate through that optimization procedure to the metaparameters to optimize for a set of metaparameters such that that optimization procedure for phi i leads to good performance. Um, so how should we get started here? So the, I guess you can essentially break down the, the meta-training problem as uh, as having, having these two terms, one that's maximizing the likelihood of your training data given your task specific parameters, and one that is uh, optimizing uh, your, uh, task, the likelihood of your task specific parameters under your meta parameters. Um, and so you can view this kind of, this, this equation right here as the optimization procedure that you wanna be able to do uh, at test time and also the optimization procedure that you're going to be integrating into your meta-learning problem during meta-training. One that's basically going to be taking into account the training data set uh, and your accuracy on the training data set, as well as uh, your prior, uh, which is given by phi given theta, where, where your meta-parameters are, are parameterizing your prior. All okay, right, so your meta-parameters are serving as your prior, um, and now we need to think about, well, what form of prior uh, should we should we basically impose using our meta-parameters? Um, well, one very successful form of prior knowledge that we've used in deep learning optimization is the initialization. Um, and in particular, one of the things that's been quite successful in deep learning is what's called fine-tuning, where we take some set of initial parameters and then run gradient descent on training data for some new task. Uh, and typically you do this not for just a single gradient step as written here, but for many gradient steps. Uh, and this has worked really well. So for example, if you look at um, so something that pre-trains on, Im on ImageNet versus training from scratch, uh, th those are the two rows shown here, and fine-tuning either on the Pascal data set or on the Sun data set. Uh, and we see a huge difference in performance using pre-training, which is uh, labeled as original in this paper, um, versus using a random initialization. Um, Great, so typically like, this is in many ways a valid approach to kind of the meta-learning problem where you first train uh, a set of, or pre-train a set of parameters on your meta-training data and then fine-tune 
on your data set at test time. Um, now, some questions that might come up is where do you get your pre-trained parameters? Uh, the typical way to do this is through, for, for, for vision problems, the typical way to do this is by pre-training on ImageNet classification on using supervised learning. Um, in language, one very popular approach for doing this is using models trained on a large language corpus, um, models like BERT or language models, uh, or other unsupervised learning techniques. So pre-training of neural networks actually has a very long history before, even well before ImageNet. Uh, where people are pre-training their, their models using unsupervised learning techniques and then fine-tuning them. Um, although, other than language, it's not, sure if, uh, it's not clear if those approaches have really been that popular recently. Um, but really, like, if you have some domain, um, in many ways, kind of the thing to do is just to take, train on some very large and diverse data set and then fine-tune fine those parameters on whatever data set you actually want to perform uh, inference on. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that pre-trained models are often available online. Uh, and so you can actually don't even necessarily need to do this step where you actually train on ImageNet. You can just download the parameters and then fine tune from there. Um, and then I guess the other thing worth mentioning here is that uh, fine tuning is a bit of an art, uh, like other, other aspects of deep learning, unfortunately. Um, and so there's a, a range of common practices for uh, performing fine tuning successfully. This includes things like fine tuning with a smaller learning rate. Um, using a lower learning rate for lower layers of the network. Uh, uh, typically the low layers, uh, for many fine-tuning problems, typically the low, low level features are the things that need to change the least, and the higher level concepts are the things that need to uh, change the most for a new task. Uh, you may want to actually freeze earlier layers of the network, potentially even basically setting them with, uh, setting a learning rate of zero for those layers. Uh, you could also consider reinitializing the last layer, um, and then typically people search over these hyperparameters using cross-validation. Um, and then the last thing worth mentioning here is that architecture choices tend to matter uh, a lot when, when choosing how to fine-tune. Uh, for example, things like residual networks tend to be actually quite good at fine-tuning um, because the gradients flow, um, flow relatively easily through various parts of the network when you have residual connections. Yeah. So you're asking, basically, when you're, when you're fine-tuning, you're not actually using any information about the target? Either fine-tuning or the previous approach where we have a learning style before network, um, PI and then the other network. We never really kind of explicitly encode which task we're using, right? It's never passed on to, it's never, it's not an argument of a previous approach at all. Yeah, so you're saying that basically we never are passing in any information about the task as input to this approach or to the black box approaches. Yes, that's, uh, that's correct. And there's actually, um, well, for meta-learning, well, there's actually some nuanced reasons for not doing that, uh, which is kind of interesting in some regard. It seems like in many ways you should pass in as much information you have about a task to the model such that it can use it. Uh, but in fine tuning, for example, um, if you say passed in a one hot vector for ImageNet and then passed it in a different one hot vector for your test task, then, uh, it actually may, like, that, that information, well, first, if they're just two separate one-hot vectors, like, the, the, the test task that you're doing it, like, versus training time, they're completely distinct things to the network. Um, and so that, that information isn't something that can actually be used during the fine-tuning process to, to help it, because it has only ever seen one task. And so kind of looking at another task, for example, won't, t telling it that it's doing a different task um, is, Go ahead. I guess my, my question is like the only uh, agent or person that knows the pair of tasks is this kind of like a person that's training the network because when you're going to test, you know you will test with the test set associated to that task. But if someone gives me a network that was trained in this manner and I just have like a bunch of images, how could I know? Like there, there's no index tracking, right? Like we had earlier in the concatenation approach and so on. Basically, an already trained network, there's no way to know what parameters to use uh, for a specific subtask, right? Like earlier, I know, oh, let's say we are trying to, we have like a vehicle image set and an animal feed, uh, set. And so maybe one has like one 
Yeah. Yeah. Like recording, and then I'm like, oh, there's a vehicle I should use. There's one. There's a animal I should use there. Yeah. So you're asking basically, you could basically tell the network. Um, like you could train it, you could pre-train it on like multitask learning. Say like first, you're, I'm going to train you on like recognizing animals and recognizing plants and recognizing cars or something, and then and, and tell it that it's going to be doing that, um, or like fine tune it on that, for example. Uh, in this case, the pre-training is just single task, uh, and the test task is also single task. So we don't actually tell it any information about kind of what task it's solving because it's kind of um, assumed that you're going to be fine tuning it on, on a new task and kind of both pre-training and testing are, um, are separate tasks. Um, I'll get to the, to the point about why meta-learning doesn't pass in task information a bit later. Yeah? So in this case, we're fine tuning the task specific parameters, but can we also be fine tuning on the shared data parameters? So in this case, we're actually not, um, I guess the, in this case, this is, uh, there isn't actually really a distinction between task-specific parameters and meta-parameters. So what we're doing is we're just pre-training parameters uh, theta, uh, which, which, which basically could be your meta, could be your meta-parameters theta, and then the optimization process is producing your task-specific parameters phi. So the theta includes both of us, basically. Um, I would actually so. I would actually say that the, the pre-trained parameters theta are the meta parameters. Okay. Uh, and that initialization is affecting, is basically serving as a prior on your optimization uh, in a somewhat implicit way. Um, because basically it's in that the, 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 the pre-trained parameters are like affecting the solution that the fine tuning process will give you. Yeah. You're saying, is this, is the fine tuning procedure pruning the network? Yeah, like, is it reducing weights and then, like, or adding stuff to the weights? So, in this case, it's actually just changing the weights. So, it's not uh, removing or adding weights to the network. But, but, like, generally, in your experience, like, what have you seen? Like, given that it's a general problem. Uh, so, you're asking, what, what, do, what do fine tuning procedures end up doing? Do they, um, I think that the kind of the accepted wisdom of, of what these things are doing are reusing features and often are changing how those features are used uh, for a new task, but not necessarily changing the features that much themselves. Um, so, and that's kind of how like the, the, the later layers of the network are changing a lot and the features themselves are not changing a lot. Um, although I don't know if anyone has actually proven anything related to that. Yeah. Yeah, so typically you'll use the same architecture or you might uh, use the same architecture but like top off the last layer. Uh, and, and when you're doing these um, updates and the fine tuning, are you, you said you're only providing one task at a time. Yeah. Right, so uh, we'll get, we'll get how, how we can integrate this into a meta-learning approach on the next slide. Um, but yeah, so typically what you do is you just pre-train parameters on a single task uh, and then fine tune on your test task. Okay, um, great. So uh, one other example of where this has been used is using um, basically pre-training using language models and then fine tuning on text classification tasks. Uh, and the plots shown here are pretty interesting. So they're showing that uh, on the x-axis, as you vary the number of training examples you have for the test task, how does the um, performance on that task vary? And so what we see first is that there's a big difference between training from scratch versus training, uh, using pre-trained parameters from universal language models, or ULM. Uh, so that's the gap between the blue lines and the orange and green lines. And then uh, the second thing that we see is that as you have fewer examples uh, in your new task data set, uh, performance gets worse. Uh, our, our error goes up. Uh, and so essentially what we see is that when you only have, for example, 100 data points for your test task here, uh, your performance actually isn't very good on your test task. Uh, and you can expect that as you actually decrease that even lower, you would do even worse. And so uh, essentially fine tuning is, is much less effective when you have smaller data sets. 
Uh, and now motivated by this, how about we design a meta-learning algorithm with the goal of being able to fine-tune with small amounts of data at test time. Uh, and in particular, what we could try to do is take our fine-tuning procedure and evaluate how well those task-specific parameters did on a test data set, on new data points, and then actually optimize for your pre-trained parameters such that fine-tuning gives you a set of test, uh, gives you a set of parameters that do well on the test data points. Uh, and you could do this optimization across all of the tasks in your meta-training in your meta-training data set such that fine-tuning with small amounts of data leads to good generalization. Um, so essentially you'll be training for uh, a set of parameters theta across many different tasks such that it can transfer effectively via fine-tuning. Um, okay, so kind of at a more intuitive level, what this might look like is say theta is the parameter vector that you're meta-learning, uh, your, your meta-parameters, and phi i star is the optimal parameter vector for task i. Then you can view the meta-training process uh, of this optimization as the thick black line, where when you're at this point during the meta-training process and you take a gradient step with respect to task three, you're quite far from the optimum for task three. Whereas at the end of the meta-training process, you take a gradient step with respect to task three, you're quite close to the optimum. And likewise for a range of other tasks. Um, and we refer to this as the model agnostic meta-learning algorithm uh, in the sense that uh, it embeds this optimization procedure in a way that's agnostic to the model that's used and the loss function that's used, as long as both of them are amenable to gradient-based optimization. Um, and then one other thing worth noting here is that this, this diagram I think can be helpful for getting across the intuition of the method, uh, but at the same time it can be a bit misleading. Uh, first, because parameter vectors do not exist in, in two dimensions, uh, and also, or, or neural network parameters do not exist in two dimensions typically, uh, and then also there often isn't a single optimum, but, but actually a whole space of optimums um, for, or a whole space of optima for uh, neural network parameters. And so in many ways it's more about um, not necessarily reaching a center point, for these different algorithms, but reaching a point um, such that fine tuning will eventually, um, will, will get you to uh, a good part of the parameter space with, uh, with, with small amounts of data. Okay, um, so that was the objective. Uh, what does this look like as an algorithm? So we can take um, the black box adaptation approach that we mentioned before uh, and uh, adapt it to the optimization based meta learning case. Uh, and essentially what this does is you first sample a task, you, can, you sample your data sets, uh, then instead of computing your task specific parameters using a neural network, you're going to be computing them using one or a few steps of fine tuning. And then you update your meta parameters by differentiating through those fine tuning steps into, your, uh, into the parameter vector theta, into your initial set of parameters. Okay. Any questions on this before I get into a few of the details? Yeah. Do you ever sort of initialize a multi-task network with uh, whatever these learned weights would be versus training a multi-task network from scratch? Do you think the, the multi-task network would be better with the, this prior? So you're asking um, what if you use multi-task learning as an initialization instead? I see, so you're saying that you could basically pre-train, do this meta-training process to get an initial set of weights and then use that as an initialization for multitask learning? Yeah. Um, you could certainly do that. I guess what this is doing is, is optimizing, the, the meta-learning the meta -learning process that I mentioned uh, on the previous slide is optimizing for fast adaptation to individual tasks given an individual data set. You could also do the same thing for pairs of tasks or triplets of tasks. Uh, if you wanted to explicitly pre-train for three-shot learning, or, or it's not, it's not three-shot learning, three-task learning, um, you could. I, I guess you could also consider doing something like like optimizing it for uh, optimizing it on on for single-task adaptation, and then fine-tuning it on multitask adaptation or multitask learning. Um, it's hard to say how well that would do because it's not actually explicitly training for what it's going to be doing at test time, but it uh, conceivably could do something effective. Yeah. 
when you talked about initializing the weights data from a pre-trained network like ImageNet, was that just motivation for this algorithm, or do you actually do that with your parameters data, or could you start with a random initialization? Right. So in this case, we start with a random initialization before this meta-training algorithm, and that was mostly serving as for, basically as, as motivation for how well pre-training could work uh, in a range of settings. Yeah. Um, so does this work uh, well even with like one-shot learning? Because it seems like even with this approach that you could risk overfitting on, on like a single uh, thing. Yeah, so this approach actually works really well even for one-shot learning, two-shot learning, um, et cetera. It's competitive with, um, with the black box approaches that I mentioned previously. So how long do you typically run that inner optimization loop? Right, so for the one-shot setting, you can you, typically the, the iter optimization is somewhere between one and five gradient steps. Um, and even with only a few gradient steps, you can get quite far. Okay, so one thing worth mentioning about this algorithm is that it brings up second order derivatives. Because we are optimizing, um, basically because we're, uh, we're optimizing for a set of uh, meta parameters, uh, so this is, we have this gradient and inside of uh, this objective term, we also have this gradient right here. Um, and so now you might be a little bit worried about this. So uh, for example, if we needed to compute the full Hessian of, uh, of the neural network, we would be in a bit of trouble. Uh, and um, what if we want more than one inner gradient step? Does that give us higher order, um, higher order derivatives? And so I wanna go through a bit on the whiteboard uh, what this, what actually the meta gradient update looks like, uh, such that we can kind of figure out the answers to these questions. Great, so let's say that um, for the sake of notation, so uh, in this case I was writing out a gradient step as the update procedure, uh, and in this case I'm just going to uh, use u to denote the, um, the update rule, and that's going to be a function of theta and your training data points detrain. So this is, uh, this is basically one uh, or a few steps of gradient descent, theta minus alpha grad theta lost with respect to detrain. Um, and I'm going to use, uh, to kind of just write out some, some notation, I'm gonna use uh, D to denote the total derivatives uh, and the uh, nabla symbol to denote partial derivatives. And we'll see why this distinction actually matters uh, in a second. And this is just for the purpose of the whiteboard. Uh, and on the slides, we'll just be using the nabla symbol, the, the gradient symbol um, for, for both. Okay, so um, as you can see on the, the bottom of the slide, um, the optimization procedure that we have looks something like an optimization over our metaparameters theta, over our loss function with respect to our task-specific parameters phi, and our test data points. I'm gonna drop the i from the notation here just for um, notational simplicity. And this is the same as an optimization over metaparameters of L of our update rule with regard to our training data set. Uh, and our test data set. Okay, so this should all be uh, clear from the board. And in order to optimize the subjective function, we need to be able to get the derivatives of the subjective with respect to our meta parameters if we want to optimize this with gradient based optimization, things like Atom, for example. Um, and so to do this, we need to be able to get uh, the derivatives of this objective with respect to our meta parameters theta. Uh, and so let's try to actually write out what this meta gradient looks like. Uh, so in particular, we can view this meta gradient. Um, first, we can basically ca compute the, with the chain rule, we can co compute the derivative of the outer function, uh, and then uh, use the chain rule to compute the derivative of the, the inside with respect to theta. So what this looks like is we'll take uh, the derivative with respect to, uh, I'll use kind of a placeholder variable phi bar of um, L of phi bar and d test evaluated at 
uh, phi bar equals u of um, of theta comma d train. So this is just the derivative of the outer objective uh, times the derivative of the um, the derivative of the update rule with respect to d train. Uh, yes, I can try to write larger from here forward. Um, so basically, this is the, the derivative, the derivative of, the of the outer loss, and then this is uh, d phi d theta. Um, this is why partial derivatives are matter, because if we kind of just wrote this as, uh, as a full derivative, then this would just be exactly the same as the, or basically be very similar to, the, um, to the, uh, what was originally written. OK. Um, right, great. So notice that this is, uh, this is like, uh, a row vector, uh, I need to write bigger. And uh, this is a matrix. Um, and so the result is uh, a row vector. Um, this can be computed with a single backward pass through the neural network. So this is, uh, you can just set the parameters of your neural network to phi bar and then compute the derivative of this loss function with respect to those parameters. So this is just one backward pass. Um, this is, differentiating through the update process itself. Um, so this is the part that is uh, a little bit trickier to deal with. Okay, um, so let's try to actually compute what this looks like. So um, we can let uh, u of theta d train. Let's just start with the case where we have a single gradient step. Um, Then in this case, uh, then we can try to take the derivative of this. So uh, derivative of the update rule with respect to theta. This is going to equal the identity matrix uh, minus alpha uh, d d theta squared of L of theta um, comma d train. Uh, and this is the this is the Hessian of the neural network. Any questions with this? Okay, so uh, if we then plug this term into here, then what we get uh, is that we this is we have this vector, and we essentially need to be doing uh, doing a vector matrix multiplication. Uh, and fortunately, this means that we don't actually have to compute the full Hessian of the neural network because we, ha uh, because we have this, all we need to compute is this Hessian vector product. Uh, and there are much more efficient ways to compute Hessian vector products via backpropagation for neural networks than, uh, that don't require you to construct the entire Hessian of the neural network. Uh, and it also turns out the standard neural network differ uh, automatic differentiation libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch will actually perform this Hessian vector computation for you uh, such that you, in an efficient way, um, that amounts to essentially performing um, additional backward passes such that you don't actually have to worry about coding this up yourself, um, which is very convenient. Okay, so that's the case if we have just a single, neural, a single gradient step in the, um, in the inner loop. What if we have multiple inner gradient steps in the inner loop? Uh, and so in particular, what if we have um, uh, u of theta comma d train? What if we have two gradient steps? So this is going to equal uh, theta minus alpha uh, d theta of L theta d train. Uh, let's call this intermediate set of parameters theta prime. And then we will have a second gradient step that is with respect to theta prime of L of theta prime D train. Is that behind the, I think, I think that's still there. Okay, so this is two gradient steps. Um, if we then want to compute the derivative of this,
then what we get is we first get the first two terms that we had before, which is the identity minus the, um, minus the Hessian. Uh, and then what about the second term? So we want to compute the derivative of this last term with respect to the parameters theta. Uh, and what this looks like is uh, first you compute the derivative of the outside. So you get um, d theta prime squared. Uh, and I'll use theta bar here of um, L of theta bar d train. This is going to be evaluated at, um, at theta prime times d theta prime d theta. Uh, and so uh, first, this, this term right here is just equal to the first two terms. Uh, and one of the nice things that we get here is that uh, we don't get third order terms here. So we get the Hessian evaluated at theta prime, which is the parameters after the first gradient step. Uh, and we get the Hessian with respect to uh, the, the original parameters, but we don't get anything, um, any third order derivatives basically. Uh, and again, this is something that we can efficiently compute. Well, efficiently basically compute with additional backward passes without having to basically construct uh, any full Hessians or without having to compute higher order derivatives, which is nice. Okay, uh, and then as you might imagine, if you continue to run this, um, continue to comp compute this for um, for even more gradient steps in the inner loop. Uh, you basically continue to get these types of terms that pop up without higher order terms. Okay, any questions on, um, on some of the math? Okay, so yeah. So um, if you're trying to differentiate this third term um, with respect to theta, you first kind of take the derivative of the outer function with respect to um, its arguments times the times this term, which is the via the chain rule. Okay, and sorry that this likes to float upward, but okay. Cool. So um, now that we've talked about optimization-based optimization based approaches, um, or at least the kind of the, the basics of them, um, let's think about how they compare to black box approaches. So um, you can view black box adaptation as having this general form that takes as input a training data set and a test input. Um, for example, using something like a recurrent neural network or something like that. Um, now, you could also view MAML or model agnostic meta-learning as also uh, taking in a training data set and a test input, where you have this function phi that takes as input the test input, uh, and the parameters phi are computed with gradient descent. Um, so essentially you can view MAML as a computation graph with this funny embedded gradient operator inside that computation graph. So if you kind of take this view, that means you can potentially mix and match components of um, of these approaches. For example, um, one paper has looked at, can you learn an initialization, uh, but replace the gradient update that MAML does with a learned neural network that produces that gradient update. Um, so for example, instead of having, uh, instead of learning the initialization then running gradient descent, you could learn initialization and have a neural network output your, your gradient update. Uh, and this was done in uh, Ravi and La Rochelle in 2017. Uh, and this paper actually precedes the, the MAML paper, um, but I, I mention it here uh, just for the purpose of understanding different things. Okay, um, and this computation graph view of meta-learning will come back again uh, later. Okay, now one other thing to think about uh, is some of like how these approaches not just compare conceptually, but also in practice and in theory. So. Um, one question to think about that was actually mentioned a bit before is, uh, what if your test task is different than the meta-training tasks that you were optimizing on? 
Uh, and so this is a, a, so a question that we studied empirically to some degree, and we were aiming to compare mammal to black box type approaches, uh, such as snail, the, 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 the architecture that used attention and convolutions, uh, as well as meta networks, which is also one of the architectures that I showed before. Uh, and we looked at uh, omniglot classification, where we tried to vary the tasks uh, and see how the performance did as you varied the tasks away from the meta training distribution. Um, so in this case, the x-axis will show the task variability, and the y-axis is going to show performance. Uh, and so in the first setting we looked at, we, um, we skewed the di digits in the Omniglot data set. So it was trained on digits that were uh, kind of in the center. And then we moved uh, kind of away from the meta-training task distribution, training it on, or testing its ability to adapt to tasks that involved skewed digits. And um, what we saw at first is that all the approaches, uh, the, their performance deteriorated as you moved away from the meta-training distribution. But we saw that uh, algorithms like MAML are better able to perform these out-of-distribution tasks uh, as you move away from the meta-training distribution because they're performing uh, an optimization procedure at test time. So because you're running gradient descent at test time, you can still expect it to give you some reasonable answer, uh, at least an answer that, that achieves good accuracy on the training data set, for example, whereas black box approaches that are just taking in a data set as input and producing an answer, um, when, you, when you move away from the training distribution, there's really uh, nothing that you can say about what those algorithms are doing. Because they, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then if you look at something like the scale of the digits, uh, we also see this sharp drop off as you move away from the training, uh, meta training data set. Um, but we kind of consistently saw this pattern that optimization-based approaches were better extrapolating because they were still giving you um, a, a procedure at test time that looked like an optimization procedure. Um, so this is one empirical trend that we noticed. Uh, and now you might ask, well, we're embedding this structure of optimization into the meta-training process. Does this come at a cost? And in particular, one very natural thing that was actually brought up a bit before is how far can you actually get with a single gradient step or a few gradient steps? Are these methods actually as expressive as the black box approaches that I mentioned before? Um, and it turns out that you can show that um, for a sufficiently deep function f, the mammal algorithm, the mammal function that I mentioned before, can approximate any function of the training data set and the test input. Um, it can basically represent anything that the black box approaches could represent under a few uh, fairly mild assumptions, under the assumptions that the, the inner learning rate is non-zero, uh, that the loss function gradient doesn't lose information about the label. Uh, the standard like mean squared error and cross entropy loss functions fall under this category. Uh, and also that the data points in your training data set are unique. And the reason why this is interesting uh, is that it means that MAML has the benefit of the inductive bias of gradient descent without losing expressive power. Yeah? What do you mean by inductive bias? Um, what I mean by that is that at initialization, like even before you do any meta training for MAML, you still have uh, an optimization procedure that's going to point you roughly in the right direction. So you're still running gradient descent, and you'll still be able to improve on your training data. Yeah? This is actually only for a single gradient step. Okay. What is sufficiently deep? Very deep. <laughs> Exponential. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 I guess the assumptions that I listed here are very mild. The sufficiently deep function is uh, is not mild. Um, it does need to be very deep, uh, and you could probably relax this assumption if you made other assumptions about the gradient pointing in the right direction um, or uh, other things about the the optimization. It does have like the sufficiently wide single layer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're running out of time. Um, the let's see. One thing I want to mention. Um, I guess we can probably just leave off where um, leave off where I left off um, on Monday next week. Uh, but we basically covered the basics of, of optimization-based meta learning. Uh, and I'll cover, uh, I'll cover the rest of it and some of the, go, go into a bit more of the advanced topics on Monday next week. 
On Wednesday this week, we have um, applications of meta-learning uh, and multitask learning to things like imitation learning and generative models, drug discovery and machine translation. Uh, I think that this will actually be pretty exciting because we'll actually see some of the real-world use cases of these algorithms. Uh, these will be student presentations and discussions. And then on Monday, I'll wrap up optimization-based model learning and cover uh, non-parametric methods and talk about how all of these different approaches compare. Great. I'll see you on Wednesday.